All right, today we're going to learn about medieval China and the Mongols. We have three daily objectives. Number one, discuss how Chinese would explain the collapse of the Song dynasties. Number two, list and explain how the Mongols won, kept, and lost their empire. And number three, explain what stopped Mongol expansion. So we talked about ancient China, now we're moving on to the medieval China. So this is after the Warring States period. China has been unified by the Song Dynasty through conquest by 960. Um, but China is much smaller, smaller than it was prior to the Song. So this is the extent of uh, medieval China under the Song Empire. This is modern day China. A um, lot smaller. Uh, they have lots of enemies, especially coming from the north, the Mongols, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And they attempted to pay off these enemies through the tribute of silver, silk, and tea. These are the three big things that the Chinese produced at that point in history. Silver, silk, and tea. Um, the Song established a new capital, Hangzhou, and a, coast, a coastal city and major trade port. The Song are growing rich by trading their silver, silk, and tea. This is an era of prosperity for the Song and for medieval China. Um, they grow to a population of about 100 million. That's about a third of the U.S. population now, which is right at 350. Um, they have 10 cities with at least 1 million people. Compare that to the major cities of Europe like Paris, which only had 60,000. This is a huge population, huge country. Um, it is still the most populous country on Earth and was then as well. They invented two really big, important technologies. The first is movable type. Basically, think about this as like the first printing press, so the first quick way to print papers, texts, and books versus, you know, like hand copying. This is especially important because we talked about, remember in Unit 1, we talked about ancient civilizations, that the um, most Asian languages have don't have letters. Um, so you've got a different symbol for every word versus a symbol for a letter. So being able to make a printing press or their version of it, which was called movable type, made writing much quicker. They invented gunpowder. Uh, which is really cool. Um, it was mostly used in the form of early grenades. They had some guns, but they weren't really that cool. Um, nothing like you're thinking of in your head. They're also going to invent the magnetic compass, which is going to make sea travel very easy. And they also invent the use of paper money, though these two are less important than these two. They're going to have the first documented use of negative numbers. This is really cool because it allows you to do math better. Um, they improved rice growing techniques, so they can now grow two rice crops per year instead of only one. This is really important if you have a growing population. This is a picture of the magnetic compass, by the way. Using their new compass, they're actually able to make it as far away as Africa. Africa is really far away from China. Um, this is kind of cool. Some people actually say that they made it to the Americas before the Europeans did, uh, which is debatable. There's not a whole lot of evidence that suggests that, but there are some people who believe it. Um, and along with their items, Buddhism, which we have talked about, uh, one of the major world religions is going to spread from China to other countries. It is originally founded in China. These huge innovations and all this wealth um, create a lot of changes in Chinese society. Number one, it's going to create a modern bureaucracy. Basically, you have people that aren't really noble like in Europe, or they're not royal like kings and queens. They're just everyday people. Um, that start getting jobs in government and making laws and policies. They're going to do this through their civil service exams. So if you want to be an important person in China in this period of history, you get an education, you go take a civil service exam, and if you pass, you get to become a bureaucrat, somebody in as part of Chinese government. This is really cool because it's actually making the smartest um, people in charge, so you have to overall have a better country. And generally, the Chinese still do it this way. Um, it's not democratic like what we have in, in, the, in the idea of electing, but it is largely merit-driven. Um, aristocracy is still around, so like the nobles are still around, um, but they're largely weak. Uh, and these bureaucrats, these, these everyday guys, are the ones making the rules. A gentry develops. So a gentry is just people whose status depend on their intelligence, skills, and wealth because these are the guys passing the exam and becoming bureaucrats. Um, in terms of hierarchy, Below the gentry are the skilled workers like that blacksmiths, then laborers and soldiers, and finally peasants are at the very, very bottom. Women are subservient to men in pretty much all ways in this society. Um, this is when feet binding is created. So elite women's feet were bound. Uh, this was supposed to be like a status symbol. If, if, if your feet were bound, you didn't have to walk. You couldn't walk. 
and this proved that you were wealthy and could could just use money to take care of yourself. Uh, this lady is so feet binding continued in China. It's largely I think it's been outlawed now, but it it, it continued into like the 1920s, 1930s. This is a very old lady because it's been banned now. Here's a picture of one of her feet bound and one of them not. Basically, they're just bound so tight that they grow into like one ball, so you can't actually use it. Pretty disgusting. Um, pretty sad for a lot of women who spent their entire lives basically sitting or laying down or being carried around. Um, Song Dynasty were conquered by the Mongols in 1279 CE. So let's talk about the Mongols. The Mongols live on the Asian steppe. This is the Asian steppe. This is a dry grassland, kind of like the Midwest in the United States. In Central Asia, they are pastoralists, which means most of their food and wealth and everything they own is in the form of animals. So they have sheep, they have goats, they have horses. Um, they are constantly on the move, kind of like our hunter-gatherers from ancient civilizations. They are constantly roaming the steppe, and their herds are constantly eating grass. And that's what they do. They live in tents, they move around. They get more animals, they fight. That's the life of a Mongol. Um, the step, the Asian step, is super important because it connects Asia to Europe. And the Silk Road goes right through the middle of that, and we'll be talking about that a lot. Um, Mongols practically live on horseback, uh, where they hunt with bows and they drive their herds of animals. So you're pretty much always on a horse as a Mongol. That's how you make your living. Their food, clothing, and houses, yurts, which are just kind of like super fancy tents, all come from animal meat, milk, and skins. The entire basis of Mongol society is pastoralism. They travel in clans. So your society is your clan. Your, your, your government is your clan. A clan is just a group of people descended from a common ancestor. So generally, like, the oldest male in the clan would, would be in charge. Um, so you're constantly traveling with, like, your extended, extended, extended family. We're talking about, like, fourth and fifth and sixth cousins. Um, and you're making your living off your animals, you're riding around, living on step, good times. So here's a picture of a yurt and some of the animals. Some Mongols still live like this, actually. Um, what you need to realize is that this is a very different way of life than the Chinese to the south and the Ottoman Turks and Europeans to the west. Um, all of those people are agriculturalists. They've got big houses. They live in one place on farms. They're farming. These guys aren't farming. They're living off their animals, moving around. These guys are what is called nomads, um, which basically just means they're constantly moving. They often traded horses for metal and other technologies they were incapable of making because, I mean, this wasn't a very technologically advanced society. Most of their advanced stuff they're either stealing or trading for, um, and they did often conduct raids, as I said before, stealing into towns and cities for things they needed. So around 1200 CE, Genghis Khan, this guy is going to actually, this is him too, is going to unite all the clans of the Mongols. One big giant clan, one Mongol clan. Under, under Genghis Khan, the Mongols conquered all of Central Asia and began invasions in the Middle East and into China. The Mongols succeed. They conquer China, they conquer most of the Middle East. Um, and here are the reasons why they, they are so, so successful. First off, Genghis Khan was a military genius. He successfully united the clans. He used them effectively in combat. He had charisma, the ability to persuade people and get them on his side, and this kept his armies loyal. Next major key to success is the Mongol shortbow. This is the Mongol shortbow. This, Mong this shortbow is capable of firing accurately 500 meters from horseback. So check out this guy. He is riding on a horse and shooting a bow at the same time. That's really cool. That is really cool. He can move and shoot at the same time. And the Mongol pony, let's talk about the horse he's riding, is a small, is small, hardy, and only ate grass. This is the perfect horse for step living and much faster than walking. Now, if you compare this to a European horse of the time that's carrying a knight, it's totally different. You got a big horse, strong horse, eats a lot. This guy is cheap. So he's cheap. You can move pretty quick on him, and you can shoot a bow from him. This is awesome. And using this, they're going to create hit and run tactics. Let me tell you what hit and run tactics are. Hit and run tactics are basically Mongols ride up on the horses with their bows, the Chinese army's in front of them, normal agriculturalist army, you got peasants with spears lined up, the Mongols shoot arrows at them, the Chinese run up, start charging at the Mongols because they don't want to get shot, obviously they want to kill the guy shooting at them. Mongols turn around and ride away. 
The Chinese army thinks they're winning, so they chase them. The Mongols stop, turn around, shoot them again. Chinese keep chasing them. Rinse and repeat until all the Chinese are dead and they win. Pastoral way of life is a major key to success. Their life is cheap and bare. All they need is grass. The grass feeds the animals, the animals feed them. So the pastoral way of life makes them very successful. Gunpowder, eventually they're going to get gunpowder from the Chinese, and they're going to use this in their siege weapons. Remember, siege is just like taking over a city or a castle. Um, siege weapons are going to be used by the Mongols against cities. And finally, they're going to use terror tactics. So here's what Mongols do. They come to the very first Chinese city. They say surrender. The Chinese city says no. They say okay. They siege the city. They destroy the city. They kill, they kill every man, woman, and child in the city. They go to the second city. They say surrender. The second city says okay. We don't want to die like those last guys did. Terror tactics. These guys are the original terrorists. They invent terrorism. Now, eventually Genghis Khan is going to die in 1227 from illness. Um, and less than 50 years after his death, the Mongols had conquered all of modern-day Russia, Poland, and China into the empire. This is the largest land empire in history, larger than anything Alexander the Great put together, larger than anything anybody had ever put together. It's huge. The empire is divided into canates or khanates. Um, there's four of them, and each part, each quarter of the empire is ruled by a descendant of Genghis, generally his sons. And the armies and wealth are also split. An era of peace follows called Pax Mongolia. Um, traders and missionaries are allowed to follow the Silk Road, which allows the transition of lots of different items and goods as well as religion. This is the road that Marco Polo, you've probably heard of him, actually traveled to China. Yes, he was real. He's not just a swimming game. Um, technologies, ideas, and diseases quickly moved from China to Europe and around the Old World, and we'll talk about that more as this unit progresses. So, what leads to the end of the Mongol Empire? So the Mongols largely allowed conquered people to keep their culture intact. So in Russia, people were Orthodox Christians, and they let them continue to be Orthodox Christians. In China, they allow people to continue to be Buddhist and, Buddhist and Confucian. Uh, over in the Middle East, they let people continue to be Muslim. And they were cool with that. Mongols didn't care as long as they were getting their money. Slowly, Mongols and each of the Khanates began to adopt the culture of their conquered country. So slowly, the Mongols living in Russia started to become Christian. Slowly, the Mongols living in China started to become Buddhist and Confucian. Slowly, the, the Mongols living in the Middle East became Islamic. They became Muslims. And this led to rifts between the Mongols and the different Khanates. Slowly, rebellions began to develop in some of the Khanates one by one. Without the help from the other Khanates, each one fell. In China, the Mongols were eventually kicked out and replaced by the Ming Dynasty. And then the Golden Horde over here in Russia lasted the longest and finally fell to Ivan III in 1480. So they made it a pretty long time. So big question is, this is the Mongol Empire, the largest land empire in history. What stopped the Mongol expansion? Why didn't they continue into Europe? Why didn't they go into India? Why didn't they take the rest of the Middle East and go into Africa? And basically what it boils down to is, if you look at the map on the left, this is the Asian steppe. We look at the map on the right, this is the Asian steppe. This empire goes around the Asian steppe. Without the grasslands to feed the animals, the Mongols can't fight. They can't go into North Africa. There's no grasslands there. They can't go into Europe. Those grasslands that they need for their sheep and goats and horses is not there. So ultimately what stops the Mongol expansion is they ran out of steppe. Long story short. Take a few minutes. Answer your three daily objectives.